Do not remember, it's in verse 18, Isaiah 43, verse 18. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. You know, before I read this, I want to tell you something. I want you to, as you're reading this, I want you to, to think about where we've been and what we're leaving behind and where we're headed in this new direction. And then I also want to tell you this. Uh, Habakkuk tells us that, that the preacher, or it says that, the, that there's a watchman that's set up on the rampart to be watching. And as the pastor of each church, I've always been able to stand up on the, in the spirit, stand and watch, and be able to stand in between the church and, and the, the fight that's going on in the spiritual realm. And at each church, there's always a different set of, of the, the demonic that's working against the church and against the pastor. And, and it's systemic, and you can see it through the years. And if you were to ask me, which I, I really wouldn't talk about it, but at each church I've been in, I could name what that demonic activity was in each one of those groups. But this is why I'm telling you about this. It's Monday night. Because, see, and I didn't understand this at first, but, uh, you know, it, in the Bible, in Genesis 1, it actually says, it doesn't say morning and evening. It says evening and morning the first day. So the day actually begins at sundown spiritually because that's the way it happens with God's perfect order. It begins at sundown. And that's in Genesis 1. What, Jacob? What's that last verse? 1 through what? 5? Is that what you remember? Okay, so it's in verse 5. And so it, where it says evening and morning the first day. So the when the sun went down on Monday, that began Tuesday, okay? And the point that I'm making is Tuesday was the day that they voted me out of the conference. And so whenever that started that day, all of a sudden I was walking across from the parsonage over to the church, and all of a sudden I felt something break in the spirit. And when it broke in the spiritual realm, all of a sudden I was free. And all I can tell you is that it was gone. All of that that I had been fighting against here, it was gone. And I felt the Lord say, you, you did what I called you to do. You did it. It's done. And I looked over here and saw so walking across. So the church building is on my right side. And it's like I felt, and I wasn't quite walking right. It's like I was walking on clouds. Now this sounds weird, but this is what happened. And then I felt the Lord say, don't you just want to reach out? And I just wanted to, I was compelled just to reach out and just touch the building. I just wanted to just touch it. And I, it was like almost as if I was going to go on up to glory. And I know it wasn't going to die. It you know, wasn't coming to an end. But it's like we had moved from one realm spiritually into another. Didn't get it right then. But I felt it whenever they laid hands on me and prayed for me. The moment we stood up and they voted us out. As pastors. Then something else happened. Thought this was interesting. Miss Reed didn't tell y'all about my not getting there in time. In time. This is kind of funny. I told him I was, but I didn't mention it. Well, I'm going to mention it. <laughs> At 10 30, they were supposed to start the vote. From 9 to 10 30, it said it was supposed to be the beginning of the, the conference stuff. and that's usually walk, walk, walk. Did y'all ever watch uh, Peanuts? You know, and the teacher is wah, 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 wah. You know, well, that's the way you'd hear it. But it said at 1030, was supposed to start the vote. So I thought, well, I'll get there 45 minutes early because I don't want to be late. 45 minutes early sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Oh, no. No, no, no. No, I should have been there an hour early just to be on time. But guess what? Praise the Lord. The Lord knew because they actually, I got in the parking lot at 9.45 and we were starting the vote 
And then they closed the boat once we already got in the stands and they moved us all up. So it was about, I would say it had to be closer to 10 o'clock when, when we actually had, they said, okay, the first boat is now closed. And that's the way she'd say it. I did, it isn't that exactly the way she put it? And guess who was praying at 10 o'clock? Miss Joyce. Because the Lord knew we needed to start right then. And so y'all were praying from the very moment that the first boat started all the way through the completion of it. That's what God had to do. And then all of a sudden that night, there something else broke loose and the Lord showed me what it is. Because see, first of all, since they voted me out, it broke loose over me at Sunday. Then it broke loose over the church on Wednesday. And that's what happened. Isn't that amazing? Hallelujah. All right, then, just to show you how God was moving in all this, from the very moment, remember I told you it starts Monday night at sundown. John Clayton jumped up in to try to grab something, and when he fell down, he fell in this hole. And when he fell in this hole, he broke his toe. And it's his big toe. And that boy knows what broken bone feels like because he's had cerebral. And so he goes, Dad, I'm sure it's broken. It already started turning blue. It already started swelling. So we go to the ER. While we get in the ER, it starts to swell. Not really swell anymore, but it's turning blue. in blue herb. And they take it, and then the, the, the nurse practitioner looks at it, and you can see the look. She's like, yeah, yeah, that's, it's broken. And so we're going to get you an x-ray. I looked at his foot and I had this feeling come over me like God was going to heal it. But remember now, that happened before I felt the breakthrough, right? Because that was right at sundown. It was really before sundown when we went to the ER. So that's before I felt the breakthrough. But whenever the sun went down, all of a sudden, he goes back to the x-ray. And when he comes, and I just had this feeling like God was going to heal it. But I was so weak at that one point spiritually that I couldn't even pray for him to be healed. I was just like, I, I just don't feel like praying. Isn't that terrible? You ever felt that weak? Well, that's what happened. And when he went back to the x-ray and he came back, that blue toe turned white again. Now, that doesn't happen, does it? Isn't that weird? It turned white again. And they said, it's not broken. Do that God can do it. So we just praise the Lord. And we moved on and came on home. But then when we came home and then I went to the church, that's when all of a sudden I felt the breakthrough of the Spirit. All right. Then on Wednesday, all of a sudden, I felt that breakthrough for the church. And that was when y'all, whenever they voted the church out. Know? And, and it's just, and it just been a jubilation since. And so I didn't realize what a hold that because of what the conference was doing and the things that they were standing for, how it was affecting us and the Spirit, I had no idea. I've always heard that, but I had no idea just how much because I think it happened just a little bit, a little bit, a little bit at a time. But isn't that the way things happen? Spiritually or physically? Like, have you ever had a stash of money and... Uh, and it's $20 bills and you go in there every now and then and you pull one and then you go in there and you pull one more and you think you still got that big stack and then all of a sudden you go in there and you get down to the last two or three and all of a sudden, where did all of it go? Because it was a slow thing. So now with that, I want you to read this. Remember where we've come from, where we're headed. Isaiah 43 verse 19. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now I shall bring forth, it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness. When I read that, I thought about how many times have we been out in the woods and you had to cross through maybe a muddy spot. It was like a mud bog. Or maybe you had to pass through and... The only way was to go through briars and you had to cut your path through there. And, and it says here that I even will make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert 
and the beast of the field will honor me and the jackals and the ostrich because I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. This people I have formed for myself, they shall declare my praise. Now that's speaking in the prophetic. Then verse 22 is telling you what's actually going on in that day and time. But you have not called upon me, O Jacob, and you have been weary of me, O Israel, and you have not brought me the sheep for your burnt offering, nor have you honored me with your sacrifices. I have not caused you to serve with grain offerings, nor wearied you with incense. You have brought me no sweet cane with money, nor have you satisfied me with the fat of your sacrifices, but you have burdened me with your sins, and you have wearied me with your iniquities. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Put me in remembrance. Let us contend together. State your case that you may be acquitted. Your first father sinned, Adam, and your mediators have transgressed against me. Therefore, I will profane the princes of this sanctuary. That's the priests. Profane the princes of this sanctuary. Preachers. I will give Jacob to the curse and Israel to reproaches. You know, I was reading the other day in the kings. I was reading the other day how, and, and this is the end of that passage, but you know, about the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah and how those kings, when one of them would begin to go the wrong direction, the reason it was so bad is it wasn't just the king that's going the wrong direction, it's that he's leading the people in the wrong direction. And whenever he led the people, whenever a king would lead the people in the wrong direction, it would be generations usually before they'd ever get back right with God. Generations. And once they started down the wrong road, it's like a domino effect. Just do 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 If you ever seen dominoes, you take the, hit the one, and they all... Or like a slow train wreck. And you see it just begin to crush in on itself. And then one more car, and one more car, and one more car. And it feels like you're powerless to stop. The sins of the father are visited upon the son of the third and fourth generation. And so, par so what is paramount is holiness. And that's what we need to make sure is in our lives. And so we need to ask God to eradicate anything from our lives that's causing us to miss our blessing. So just like those curses that happen whenever the sins of the Father are visited upon the Son in the third and fourth generation. The same way, so anyway, so they're cursed in the country, cursed in the city. They're cursed with uh, their safety in the country. They're cursed with, with their work. They're cursed with their health. Everything they do is cursed. But it's the exact same opposite whenever people serve the Lord. You know, this is 4th of July weekend. And we have the blessings of Almighty God on the nation. And, and the reason that God blessed this land is because people wanted to come here and they wanted to worship the Lord in freedom. And they wanted to be able to serve God the way they wanted to serve God. And people fought to keep this country free. And then some of y'all remember World War II and then we got one right here that fought in it. And I was Shima. Isn't that right? Did I say that correctly? Thank you. And he was over there in that battle. And I was Shima. And he 
he was fighting, and they, they, he thought, and they, they told him, said, you, may, you probably aren't going to make it home alive. But they said, well, we want to fight for this country and keep this country free. So people can continue to worship the Lord. And the reason I bring out World War II is, is not really to toot Mr. Mel's horn or to toot whatever family member all of y'all had that was in World War II. But it's really because World War II really depicts what we're talking about. Because it was a battle over faith. One of the things, communism. It was about communism. And they were burning Bibles during that day and time in other countries. And they were trying to eradicate the world of good. But yet Americans stood up and said, not here, it won't happen. And we will fight in the cities. And one of the statesmen, I believe it was Sir Winston Churchill, said, said, we'll fight in the cities. We'll fight in the countries. We'll fight in the streets. But he said, we'll fight until the end. And they did. They fought for what they believed. And so the blessings of Almighty God have been on this country. And so that's why we keep praying. You know, like the song that Ronnie had the choir sing. And that y'all sang so beautifully. If my people who were called by my name. Will humble themselves. Seek my face. Hallelujah. And the blessings of God. Will be upon the people. And they'll be blessed in the country. Blessed in the city. Blessed in their health. Blessed in everything that they touch because it's for the Lord. Glory to God. Holiness is paramount. The Lord show us where we mess up. And who did it say that it, in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 14, this is where Elijah has just fought the Mount Carmel victory. And then he's afraid. He feels like he's on an island. He feels like he's all by himself because all of a sudden, you know, he looks around and he remembers all these prophets that the wicked Queen Jezebel has killed. People who he's tried to save their life and yet they've killed. He's tried to tell people to worship the Lord God Almighty, but all of a sudden they've just they've torn down God's uh, altars and they've forsaken the covenant. And, and Elijah's just sick of it. And he feels like I fought the good fight, but it's to no avail. He's getting discouraged. Oh Lord, just take me home. And so finally he says, Well, I just got to get along with God. And then finally he gets up there to the mountain of God and he, he sees the strong wind, but God's not in the wind. He sees the earthquake and feels the earthquake, but God's not in the earthquake. And then finally he sees the fire, but God's not in the fire. But then all of a sudden God's in the still small voice. And so he goes out there and, and God says, Elijah, what are you doing here? And, a lot of, you know, and God says to Elijah, what are you doing here? And finally in verse 14, Elijah says this. And he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Who did he say had torn down the altars? God's people. Now this is where I want you to think about where we've been. Who had killed the prophets? God's people. Who had forsaken the covenant? God's people. And then he says, I alone am left. So he's, <laughs> this is kind of funny, he's perceiving to tell God how it is. And so, <laughs> God's about to tell him about that statement. I alone him. I'll deal with that in a minute, Elijah. But first, this is what he tells him. 
Then the Lord said to him, Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Hazel as king of Syria. Also you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshai, the king of Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Maholah, you shall anoint his prophet in your place. It shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Hazael, Jehu will kill. Whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall kill. And then here's where he straightens him out on about when he said, I alone am left. He says, yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel. All whose knees have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. I have reserved 7,000. Now let me tell you about that verse because we got to see that firsthand Wednesday night. First of all, I have felt that many times like Elijah, that, that we are out here on an island right by ourselves. Many, many times. But so, but even so, I would still preach that God was going to send revival one more time because that's what God told me. He's going to, he's going to set the church ablaze one more time. God's told me there's going to be a doubling. So I would preach that. And I would say, God said there's going to be a doubling. I don't know what the doubling is of, but it's going to happen. And I guarantee it because God said it and I believe it. That there's going to be a, a stirring and a moving of the Spirit and the Holy Ghost and power because God said it was going to happen and I believe it. Even though I felt like I was on an island and I was right by myself so many times. And then finally I began to, to feel even more pushed down and, and, and more kind of like a like it, it was just making me go down. And then I begin to sometimes think, well, maybe, Lord, and then I get in the flesh. Well, maybe, Lord, maybe I, I've done everything you're supposed to do for me. Maybe it's almost over. Maybe I misheard you. I don't know. And then the other day I got so discouraged, but I remembered what Junior Hill said, that old evangelist who, start, who taught me to do this, to write the names of people that you lead to Jesus in the front of your Bible. And whenever you get discouraged, look at those names. There's one page. And then those stickers you see, I think John Clayton put those in when he was about two. <laughs> and then all those names. And I began to, another day I counted them up because I got so discouraged. Not because I thought felt good about myself, but that I was discouraged. And I began to count them up. And I counted about 170 something names. But I was still discouraged. Because I felt like Elijah. I felt like, you know, I'm out here right by myself. And, and you know, and they've broken down, broken down your altars. They've broken your covenant. And they've killed the prophets. <coughs> And you might say, well, now, wait a second, Brother Ron. I don't remember that any preachers being murdered. Well, I'll tell you what they did do. They silenced them and said, don't you speak against this. Because if you do, we can bring you up on charges and we'll be <coughs> That's what they told us. There was one of them, remember, that today he's not even preaching and the reason that he's not preaching as an elder is because that he was a conservative and there was a little loophole that they could try to go through even though it's against the high courts of the church. But they went through that loophole and they, uh, they offered him less than an elder appointment. And he said, well, if you're going to quit playing by the rules, as we told the, the, the higher said, if you're going to quit playing by the rules, then I'm just through. I'm just, I'm just going to hang it up. And today he's not preaching in the pulpit. So he might not be killed, but his spirit is killed. He's not a preacher right now. 
So I felt like Elijah. Oh Lord, we're out here right by ourselves. And sometimes I, I mean I knew there were others, but sometimes I'd feel like I alone and left. And then they seek to take my life. Wait, wait. But hallelujah. He says, But I have reserved 7,000 that have not bowed the knee and they have not kissed the idol. Wednesday night we went into that global meeting. And y'all, I haven't been in such a jubilation. I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I don't think I've ever been at a jubilation like that at an annual conference. Ever. Ever. Joy, tell them real quick how it felt. Remember you oh, tell them. Yes, Stand up, turn around. And I'm putting her on the spot. She didn't know she was supposed to. You know how I did. Yeah, I'm Anyway, you felt as close as you could possibly get without becoming to go enough to heaven yourself. So, I mean, it was absolutely amazing. You could just feel the presence of God. And it was so strong. And all of a sudden, I looked around, and the place was packed. It was over 300 people in there. I didn't count, but they finally had to bring out more chairs. They had to bring out more tables and more chairs and more tables. And it was such a long line. It took an hour to get everybody through the food line. I don't even think they were prepared for that many people coming through. The line, I promise you, it just went like from over to this door. Imagine if it went all the way to that wall and all the way back and just wrapped around all the way to the door. It was just amazing. And every one of these people were, would love the Lord. And every one of these people were on fire for Jesus. And it was exciting. And I began to think, you know what? How did I always feel at annual conference? I always felt like I was a nobody. And like that they tried, since you weren't in that group that's the ladder climbers, then they don't know who you are and they don't care. And so I, never, I, said, I thought to myself, wait a second. If I'm a presiding elder, I don't ever want anybody to feel that way with the global network. So I just began to speak to everybody in the line, and I spent time talking to them and, and asking them who they were and how glad we were to see them there and how excited we were. And, and, and all of a sudden, then finally, all right, so we got done with that, and, and somebody said, well, now you need to go ahead and get in line and... I was like, no, I'm not concerned with eating. I'm concerned with talking to y'all and getting to meet the family. And we began to talk. And then finally, at the end of the line, uh, I heard a note played on the piano. And as soon as I heard the first note played on the piano, I felt the power of God start to fall. And I was like, ooh, Lord. Who is that on that piano? And it's not that, and, and I'm not saying anything against the piano playing. It was good piano, but it's not like it was the most accomplished pianist in the world. What I'm talking about is the anointing of God was on it. The glory of God was invoked and falling as she began to play. And I looked over there, and it was Leanne Williamson playing. And I just thought, oh, that's why. <laughs> that makes sense. Why the anointing is, is, is here and why the glory is following her. And then I felt the Lord tell me to go pray at the altar. And so I went to the altar and began to just pray in the Spirit for a long time. And then finally I felt the Lord tell me to, I, I needed to eat the fish. And I told the Lord, I said, Lord, I'm really not hungry. And the Lord told me, eat the fish. And so I said, okay, Lord, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to eat the fish. <laughs> So I went over there and I got in the line and I got a couple of pieces of fish on my plate and I walked through and then I didn't see any more tartar sauce because remember I'm the last one in the line and and then and then I went over there and I wanted something to drink remember I don't like sweet drinks so I went and I looked there's no unsweet tea so I got water and I sat down with it and I was thirsty so I took the first drink of water y'all that was the best water I ever tasted in my life but now I didn't know why at this moment. I'm just going in the spirit in what God said to do. And then I tasted the fish. This is the best fish I've ever eaten in my life. Y'all, I think those folks at Amy are good cooks. But I don't think that it's that they know how to fix that fish that good. What I think happened is John chapter 21. 
where it says that the Lord Jesus said, Y'all, come on in. I have bread and fish upon the fire. Because all of a sudden, I think we got served. I think the Lord Jesus himself touched that fish in that water. I don't think that water was from this earth. I think that was the water from the rivers of the Lord, from the rivers of heaven. I believe that. Just no doubt what God was doing in that meeting that night. Then all of a sudden, the worship began to start. And, and then there was this man that got up. Well, first of all, they didn't have, he wasn't able to be there. He's 87, working on 88. His name is Maxie Dunham. Maxie Dunham got on the screen. He said, I was supposed to be here, but I wasn't able to be here because of different things. But my goodness, he's almost 88 years old. I think we can kind of understand that something might have happened. He said, but I am so proud of what God is doing. He said, I've been praying for this for 70 years. Do y'all feel that? He was like, I've been praying for this for 70 years. And you could just feel the wind blow over the people. And then there's another one that got up with anointed preaching. And and listen to the confirmation. As y'all heard what I've been preaching all these years, and when I tell y'all that God has shown me these things, this is verbatim. And Amy heard it, and every time Amy said she'd hear it, she'd say, she'd look at me, and because she knew that God was confirming again and again and again everything that God's been telling us all these years. Everything that God's been telling us for 20 years. Isn't that right? And this is what we heard. And think about what I told y'all right before we had the vote or right after we had the vote. This is what Lauren uh, Porter, he's the pastor at Yazoo City, said. He got up and said, the decision you just made will cause people to come to salvation. And y'all heard me say that before? The second thing that they said was one of the guys that got up and preached, whether it was Lauren or the President Pro, which is Tim Prather or whoever got up, but said about holiness, that this is a move of holiness. And immediately I began to think about the Asbury revival. And then one of them got up and said, I believe there's going to be a doubling in the name of Jesus. And I was like, We've heard that too. The Lord showed And I've not told them that. Hadn't talked to us. Remember, I don't know these people. There were only about eight people in the whole room that I knew. But remember, what did God tell Elijah? He said, there's 7,000 that have not bowed the knee nor kissed the idol. And I was able to see to that day some of those 7,000 for our, for our situation. Hallelujah. And then, then, then when Maxie Dunham got up, he, whenever he's the one who was speaking on the video because of what he's 88, almost 88 years old. And he said that this is going to be a charismatic movement. And said, we don't need to be afraid of it. It's just going to be a move of God and people moving in the Spirit. He said, you need to go back and read those passages in your Bible. And then one of them said, this is going to be a revival that's going to take place. And the revival flame is going to blow and it's going to, it's going to fall on the people. And then one of them said, he's, he's going to do it one more time. Isn't that what I told y'all that God told me? He's going to do it one more time. And so all of a sudden, I realized that God was reaffirming everything that God's been telling me all the time. Then we began to worship. And as we began to worship, I was, I was closing my eyes and I had my hands raised and we were singing Love Divine, All Loves at Selling. We sang, Oh, for a thousand tongues to the same. We sang Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. And while we were singing, all of a sudden I began to feel angels circling around the building. I that. And I remember as I was over circling and I didn't see them, but I could feel them. I was looking up and I saw all the columns in the building. And I thought, how in the world are they flying and not hitting those columns? 
And then I thought, well, how funny. They're spirits. They just go right through it. And I was like, how funny did I? But I mean, that's how sure I was that they were flying. So I looked at them, how are they doing that? How do they fly around those columns and not hit them? <clears throat> but they were circling and circling and circling as long as we were worshiping the Lord. I'm telling you. You know, we know eyes have not seen, ears have not heard the glory that God has prepared for those who love Him in heaven. But I think that we're going to see some of that right here in our midst if we're walking in holiness and if we're walking in Jesus and if we're walking in the way of the Lord and that we're stepping into a new area. It's like we're crossing over Jordan. And then there was a lady from the wall as I was meeting people in the line. And she said that she's been praying and having a prayer group and believing God for 20 years. And then you know what? When you think about it, that's about the same time that the Lord told me to be a Methodist preacher and that I started it my first appointment 20 years ago. And the Lord was showing me the same thing. But the Lord told me to keep my mouth shut and keep my head down until such a time as this. And then all of a sudden he said he would lose my will. So I'm here to tell you that we're moving into a new area. And God's going to do a new work. Just like we read in that Isaiah passage 43. And he's going to do a mighty work through this church and through this conference. And in mission work, and with the youth, is we're going to have a, a lot of different programs that we're going to have with the whole district uh, for all of the, the youth in our district and, and have uh, mission projects and so excited to see what God is going to do in revival. You heard about Sandtown this week, didn't you? They've had so many baptisms that the poor old preacher on his way out, his back's hurt because he, he had to baptize so many people this week. Isn't that a, a wonderful problem to have? Hallelujah. Glory to God. And I said, well, we don't have that many that we baptize them, but you know, I've got another five I've got to baptize. One got saved this week on Monday. Glory to God. Just excited to be able to live in this day and time and see what God's doing in that little heart. And I just wanted you to know what y'all did the other day and what we're doing. Let's pray. Lord God, I pray that you bless us as we go into a time of communion. And Lord, that you move in our hearts. And Lord, that you fill us with your peace. And God, that uh, you just show us the next thing and you know we'll do it. In Jesus' name. Miss Wanda, will you help me? He gave himself up for us. He took the bread and he broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples and he said, Take it, all of you. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this as often as you eat of it in remembrance of me. And so then when the supper was over, he took the cup. And again, he gave me thanks and praise and he gave it to his disciples and he said, Drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of my new covenant. Poured out for you and for me for remission of sins. 
And so in remembrance and grieves your mighty acts, we offer ourselves a holy and a living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us. Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and wine that they may be for us the body of the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ. Redeemed by your blood. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. All are welcome at the Lord's table.
Our <clears throat> hymn of invitation, hymn number 501. Now I belong to Jesus. Let's stand and sing the first and second stanzas, hymn number 501. 